Uh, I guess just in terms of general housekeeping, there's there's not much. Manhattan. Right? Manhattan, the Manhattan, the Upper West Side opens in like a month, six weeks, two weeks, two months, probably two months. Yeah, probably two months. But the Upper West Side opens in a couple of months, and that's exciting. Um, but overall, um, just a friendly reminder for everybody: if you're feeling off, come in. The vitamin infusion feedback's been tremendous. Yoga's been tremendous. Um, all the kind of holistic. Dimitri, I don't know. If, so we do a lot of holistic things in the office, and these are things that we're learning as we do them, <laughs> which I'm sure people don't like to hear that, that their practice is kind of, but um, it's been like tremendous. Like now our doctors will procure, like advise members to get a certain vitamin infusion, and then they come back and they feel a lot better. We have mental health in the office. So um, I don't know if you see it in your specialty, but mental health is like a pandemic epidemic, a pan epidemic, you name it. And it's impossible to get in. Um, so we bring them to the office. Um, and then yoga, meditation, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's been a hit. We're now doing, actually, there's a company that does uh, virtual nutrition. Like, they're in network. They do virtual nutrition counseling. And they're excellent. And we've been sending them some of our members. And now we're formalizing the relationship where all our members will get, like, annual uh, nutrition check-ins. Um, and then if they need to talk to a nutritionist, they can. So we're pulling that into the practice. So we have mental health, we have yoga, we have vitamin infusions, we have nutrition, all with primary care. And um, and it's all digital because um, most of our relationships through the app. So it's pretty unbelievable. Like now that I think about it, I I'm like very proud of the team. Like um, like you see Mo here. Mo's been with us uh, almost since the beginning. His sister was with us from the beginning. Um, where we were just like, ha, uh, can we do this so the phone never rings in the office and people can just make an appointment through the app? Can we do it where the phone never rings and they pull the doctor out of the room, but they could text us questions? Can we do it where there's no waiting time? People are seen on time for reservations instead of waiting for appointments. Uh, can we do this uh, with specialists that we love and trust? And we we book the patients with the specialist instead of sending the referral and they're out in the wild. Uh, can we put yoga studios in the office since that's better than writing medicine for half the stuff we treat, back aches, mental health. Um, and remember, like, we'd sketch this out, and <laughs> every time we would discuss it, people were like, no, you can't do it. And then when we'd ask, why can't you do it, we never got a good answer. And we said, screw it. Let's see if we could do it. And now our offices have yoga studios. We just built our third yoga studio in the Munaki office. Um, we do about... Five days a week we do mental health. We have mental health in the office. Um, and the members, and the, you know, the proof is in the pudding. The members love it. Like, all we get is thank yous. And it's funny, like, the primary care that we were known for is kind of a smaller piece of what we do. And it's, a, it's an important piece, but it's this holistic thing. And when I say holistic, I don't mean holistic, just non-traditional. I mean holistic, like W-H-O, in terms of entirety. And we love it. Um, and it's more fun, the work. Like, it's not work. Like, I don't know. I go, I see Mo. Uh, like, I get to work with Mo side by side half the half the days. We work together. If I'm with Mo in Paramus, if I'm with Jenny um, in um, Edgewater, Jasmine, um, it's like, I don't know, it's like hanging out with your friends. Because you, you know this. I mean, when we get to your story, when you love what you do, it's not work. And you know, you know what's funny? I've, I've said this before. It's funny. People are like, dude, how do you work so much? People, people are always like, you work so much. Why do you work so much? I, in my inside, I'm like laughing. I'm like, I have yet to work. <laughs> I swear to God, I haven't worked. And by the way, I don't think I could work. I really don't. I like to get out of bed and like run to my car and race to the office and hang out with the people that I love and do stuff that I enjoy. The second you tell me, I mean, look, when my wife tells me to do something I don't want to do, I don't do it. I don't have patience for that. I lack <laughs> discipline, so I have to do something I love. Otherwise, I wouldn't have make a living. So so that's, I, I, of course, I go off on a stupid, unintelligent so, rant. Someone asked the question. They asked, can you create a sniffles club for sick kids that can't go to school but parents have work? By the way, I've heard that before. Um, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> But I've heard that before, and it makes sense. And I, I, if one of the viewers or listeners has like, I don't know, I guess what we need is we need someone who's run daycares but wants to do it in a disruptive, innovative way, and we could partner with them. I guess that's the right answer because yeah. I have no idea how to do that. Um, anyway, to our venerable guest, 
Um, I don't want to steal any shine. Um, we always start with kind of having our guests just talk about their journey leading up to kind of your background, your origin story, what happened, how you got to where you are. Um, and then um, after we chop it up a little bit, there's usually 10, 15 questions from the viewers that comes in live and Mo will filter them. So with that. Well, mine is a pretty boring story. I uh, was born and raised in New York. Um, I did my undergraduate work at Columbia University in New York City. I went, uh, my, my goal was actually going to journalism originally. I wanted to work at uh, NBC. And while I was at Columbia, I was a page at uh, 30 Rock. Wow. For a while. Okay. I actually worked with uh, Sue Simmons and Chuck Scarborough way back when on Channel 4 News. Wow. Have to remember Sue Simmons and Chuck Scarborough. Sure. Um, Chuck Scarborough's son now is the Joe one that's on, is on MSNBC. Yeah. And he was, uh, he was uh, a representative in Florida. Um, maybe. I don't remember. Yeah. And so um, after Columbia, I didn't go into journalism for very different reasons um, because to work – I wanted to be in front of the camera. So if you want to be in front of the camera, they have so many requirements. How tall you have to be, how much weight you can oh, gain, really? how much hair you can lose. The, the contract was ridiculous, and I knew I would never be able to satisfy those requirements. These days, HR wouldn't let that fly. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> DEI, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, long story short, I ended up going to Barry University down in Miami, Florida. Did four years of training down there, or – graduate work, um, did my fellowship up at the Meadowlands Hospital in Secaucus, New Jersey. That's where I met Dr. Zom Baker, your dad, who is uh, still a mentor to me. Thank you. Um, from there, I did a fellowship. I went to Germany for fellowship in a town called Karlsruhe, which is between Stuttgart and Frankfurt in southwest Germany. Beautiful town. Um, a lot of trauma over there it was trauma AO fellowship. So when it comes to any type of fracture and stuff like that, there's pretty much nothing I haven't seen. Um, I did a small stint at the pediatric hospital over there and then came back here and opened up practice back in 1992. And it's been private practice ever since for the last 31 years. And can you, that's a hell of a story. So you've been around. Can you tell us a little bit about like your typical array of cases and your specialty, because you did different fellowships, not everybody. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So podiatry is the study of, let's say, the foot and the ankle. And there's really no age range, right? So it's from birth till 85 years old, let's say. Um, we handle, or I should say, when I say we, I'm talking about the profession, we handle anything that has to do with foot and ankle. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have a very busy practice and there's nothing that I don't do. So I'll do from pediatrics, basically anything older than six months up to the elderly. And there's really no age limit at the upper limit. Um, I've been fortunate enough, like I said, to have a, a very busy practice through great referrals and great people that refer patients to me. Um, I'm also the director of the residency program that we have at uh, Hackensack Marine Health Palisades where your brother, Dr. Yad Baker, is also the residency director for family medicine. That's how we're intertwined a little bit, that we all, let's say, have the symbiotic relationship. Um, so I get a chance to teach students how to do what I do for a living, because hopefully I'll have better investments and be able to retire before I'm 90. <laughs> um, and that's pretty much it. We, we'll get into the gamut of what I treat, but basically for peds, pediatrics that is, they're coming in with, let's say, foot deformities. God forbid if they have them from birth, it's basically a club foot. Or as they grow up older, maybe the parents are concerned about flat foot deformities, or maybe they have a high arch foot, which we can get into. And the adults, if it's an elective thing, it's basically like a bump or a, a heel pain that they may have, right? So they wake up in the morning and they have fasciitis from the tight fascia, or maybe they develop a bunion or a hammer toe or something's bothering them. And then, of course, you have the trauma, right? People who twist their ankles or people who break their ankles or they... They hit something and they break a bone in their foot because pain shouldn't be normal, right? Mm -hmm. That's the bottom. And the thing I love about this group, Baker Health, and I'm going to give them some props now, is that they don't like to go with medications right away, right? They're going into this whole holistic approach, with I, which I think is great because how many patients do you see that are on 25 different medications? Yeah. And you say to yourself, do they really need all 25? Yeah. And so the fact that they're going with a holistic approach I think is novel and I think it's excellent. And you should be proud of yourself for, for being pioneers in that. Um, and personally, I don't give a lot of medications either. The only thing I'm basically giving is an antibiotic if they have an infection or I'm trying to control their pain post-op. Yeah. 
That's great. So I think one thing before we get into the questions, it's um, it's unique. Um, I just want to compliment your practice because, you know, the criteria we generally have uh, in terms we get we get asked. Mo could tell you we get asked a lot like, a uh, how how we choose the specialists that we're affiliated with and b um, what what's the criteria uh, that. Uh, you know, makes makes a specialist someone that you would want to go to. Like we get, you know, because you you may know this, you might not. Some specialists don't know this. From our perspective, when a kid comes or a mom comes or a dad comes or whatever, and we send them to podiatry or ENT or derm, I don't know if you know this. It, it, meaning specialists know this. When they go to you guys, and then they come back to us. They're, they hold us accountable for that experience, right, 100%. Mo? Yeah. They come back and they're like, hey, Mo, remember um, you and Dr. Baker said, you know, Jimmy needs to see ENT and you referred me to such and such? We're like, yeah. Oh, well, I, I wish you didn't do that or thank you for doing that. And they don't tell the specialist that because they look at us as their doctor, like long term. And the reason I'm saying that is it didn't take me long to realize that most primary care doctors just give a referral on a prescription, say you need to see cardio or podiatry or derm, go. And when they do that, two things happen. And I, this is a tip. We have a lot of med students and residents and doc, young doctors that watch us. This is a tip. Don't think for one second that when, when someone you're treating goes to a specialist as a primary care, that that problem is off your table. It very much is not. They're going to hold you accountable for the experience, the non-clinical experience, and they're going to hold you accountable for the clinical experience. And if they don't do well clinically or the experience is crap, they're going to blame you more than the specialist because you told them to go there. And if you send them to the right guys, they're going to thank you too. It's like the quarterback on the team. The quarterback could be okay when the team wins, even if it was the receivers and the running back, quarterback gets the credit. But even if the quarterback has a good game and the team loses, they're going to blame the quarterback. You're the quarterback as the primary. And so what I learned is you have to be very, very selective about the network you work with. And so the three criteria, and Mo knows this, the three criteria we have is they, they got to be in network. They got to be high quality. I would send my kid there, my mother there. And they have to prioritize accessibility the way we do. And so... You know, we get some guys take in network. We got some folks, they're great doctors. We trust them, but they cherry pick insurances. We don't let that go. If if nothing else, our team doesn't have the time to be like, oh, you have Aetna, not Cigna. You can't go here or there. You're adding work to our team when they have enough work. We can't play that game. Um, accessibility is paramount. We, we I mean, you, we were talking about this before the camera came on. Yep. Um, I could be the best doctor in the world. I'm useless if I'm home in bed. How good, how great of a doctor I am I if I can't fix you when you need me, you know? Um, and so the best piece of advice I got, not from my dad, because 90% of the best advice I got was coming up under my dad. Um, this is a shout out to, she's definitely not watching. I don't know if you know her. She's Dr. Irani. She delivered both my sons. She's an OB. She's been around for 45 years. She's in Rutherford. Um, she's also in Hackensack and uh, Ramsey. She delivered both my sons and she's what we call, you know, this term, she's the doctor's doctor, right? Like she's delivered almost every doctor's kids. And I mean, she's, she's been around, she was, she was a senior attending when my dad came out. <laughs> All right. And so when, when I first started and I'd get called to the delivery room and she needed something or whatever, and she didn't know who I was and blah, blah. And she's like, oh, you, you know, you come at three in the morning, blah, blah, whatever. And you know, when you're starting off, you have to do that. Otherwise, how are you going to get in? And she goes, it's the three A's. And since since she said A's. this, yeah, since she That's said right, it, the three I've, A's. I've heard people tell me, yeah, of course, the three A's. But um, you need to be available. Tell your viewers, available. Affable and able. So it's ability. You got to be good at what you do. You got to be affable. Don't be a you know what. Be and, a nice guy. And accessible. And accessible. Um, and sounds simple. You do you do those three things. You're in the top one percent. Hundred percent agree top, with you. Not in the top ten percent. If you're there when when they need you, for me it's patients or members. 
And for specialists, it's the primaries, right? That's how you look at it. If you're nice, you're, you don't suck to deal with, just to be blunt, and you're good at what you do, that's it. I wanted to underscore one of the comments that you made, that that without a doubt, the primary is the quarterback. But one of the things that I always tell my residents when I'm doing surgery is that I'm not trying to make friends in an operating room. I'm here to get a result. Because like Dr. Baker just told you, it's all about accessibility, being an, a likable person as well, and your results at the end of the day, right? So I tell these residents when we're in the operating room, you're going to learn from me, but there's only one person that I care about in this room, and they're asleep on the table. I don't care about the anesthesiologist. I don't care about the circulating nurses or anybody else in the room. The only person I care about in that operating room is the person that's on the table. I'm not trying to make friends there. That's not a place you make friends. It's all about results. Yeah, 100%. And that's an interesting... I'm glad you brought that up. It, there's an interesting world that, um, you know, people, are. I find, are curious about doctors and clinicians' lives, personally and professionally, on some level. Like, that's why there's so many TV shows and um, all those things. But I think there's th there is behind the scenes, and they're curious about the behind the scenes, but there's things they don't realize sometimes. And to your point about, you know, when when the rubber meets the road, you're not there to make friends. It's funny, like in my world, especially when I started, let's take the delivery room, right? And things get intense. Something's going wrong, right? You have anesthesia, you have the OB, you have the neo, you have the pediatrician, you have whoever. Um, when I was coming up in the PICU, in the pediatric ICU, right? In those early years, right? When you're coming up, you send a message, you're in the pediatric ICU, kids crashing, right? Let's say a motor vehicle comes in. Um, I was in New York at the time. Motor vehicle accident comes in at midnight, okay? Um, and kids all smashed. You need plastics because of deformities. You need uh, pediatric cardiology, right, for pressors to keep. After a few of these cases, you know when you text person X or when you call, back then we were calling them, when you call per, or page, we were paging them. When you page person X, gets back to you in 45 minutes. And then when he gets back to you in 45, he or she gets back to you in 45 minutes. Th this is this is all I needed to know. They get back to me in 45 minutes. Dr. Baker, Dr. So-and-so is on the phone. I'm like, Jesus, finally. I go to the nurse's station. Kid's crashing. I need this guy. He's a cardiologist or a plastics. Hey, yeah, it's Dr. Smith. Yeah, hey, it's Z. Um, did you get the story? I know the guy got the story because I, I gave it to the intern. Uh, no, what is it? Um, well, this kid, blah, 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 motor vehicle accident, seven years old, severe, you know, uh, cranial damage. He's getting a scan now. We don't know if he, we think he has a bleed in the head. We need you to come in. Come in now? Well, he's getting an MRI, right? Yeah, he's getting an MRI. Well, okay, so he's going to be down there for like two hours, right? This guy. And I'd click in his, now, after a few times, I didn't, because all that goes through my head is if this was your kid, this conversation not only wouldn't have happened, you would have been here when you got the message. You would have jumped out of bed, taken your pajamas off, put your scrubs on, and been here. And thank God most guys are like that. They come running in. But what starts to happen is when I say be affable or be a nice guy, to a limit. I mean with the members, with the patients were nice. But I think what every patient wants is to know that their doctor, who's hopefully a nice man or woman, Genuinely a nice, otherwise, by the way, they wouldn't be spending their life taking care of people generally, but will advocate, defend, and sometimes attack for their patients. And and any doctor who doesn't have war stories about that, I can promise you, isn't just because he's a nice guy or girl, it's because they're not advocating enough. If you haven't ruffled feathers at emergency rooms or in the OR, you're going to tell me that with our health care system today, Everyone's always on the same page doing the right thing. No way. And so if you don't have war stories and scars, you haven't been advocating hard enough. And you don't have to be mean about it, but you, you get a rep. And, and I, I love, I love when people come in and they say, oh, you know, thank you so much for sending me to Dr. Demetrius, Dr. Nakap. Like you, you get these compliments and it gets to the point where you know, I get such confidence when I could send somebody to you. I could send someone to, uh, we had uh, Dr. Pamela on. Right, my good friend. Yeah, when I when you send you send 
work where you know, you know when the when you're sending that member, they're going to come back, their problem's going to be fixed, and they're going to thank you because they they met you as a podiatrist, you as a cardiologist, you know? And so it's a, it's a something, when people talk about the behind the scenes, the lifestyle, like running around, being on call, what they don't realize is there's something of a fraternity or a sorority um, among us, right? Because in the end, I'm trusting, you know, the people come in, they trust, trust me with their kid, let's say. That's like the holiest thing. <laughs> That's like, I, 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 me and Mo say this all the time. Every day I walk into the office, every day I'm like, I can't believe people trust me with their kid. It's like the, it's like astonishing responsibility and we take it as such. And then I'm going to pass it on to you. And so that's a responsibility we share and there's no greater responsibility. So I'm glad you nope. mentioned kind of, you know, the advocacy piece. Without a doubt. I couldn't agree with you more. Thanks. There are even other instances where let's say you're doing a case and I'm talking about a surgical case because that's what I do for a living that you're not sure what type of implant. Like Mo was telling me he's got a sprained ankle and they're we were considering maybe he's just, putting He's in just planting the seed to miss work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Mo, you're not allowed. I'm not giving you a note for work. Um, so like a sprained ankle, for instance, right? Sometimes we do ligament reconstructions and that's if there's a complete tear or if the, or if the ligament pulled off the bone. So sometimes we'll have a rep in the room that's selling a certain product that has a ligament reconstruction kit to it, right? But let's say you go in and you do the arthroscopy, you don't see the tear. Some doctors will feel obligated because the rep came in to use that product even, oh, really? when, even when it's not indicated or needed. Wow. Oh, I'm not that, talk about, you were talking about scars. Right. I'm not here to make the rep money. I right. tell you, there's only one person I care about. Right. It's the patient on the table. Right. So if they don't need that ligament reconstruction, they're not getting it. I right. don't care who came in the room. You don't know until you go in for sure, yeah? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes that's why you do a diagnostic arthroscopy first to confirm what the MRI told you. Right. Because how many times have you seen an MRI that maybe wasn't exactly 100% on yeah, the money? A lot of times. Yeah. Right. That's great. Should we get into some questions? Yeah, you think? a lot of questions. Um, this one was asked a couple of times. Someone asked, How do you pick the right shoe size for your toddler or kid? The right shoe size for what? Your toddler or kid. Well, the problem is the children's grow so quickly, right? The the right shoe size today may not be the right si shoe size tomorrow. So the Braddock device, if you if you remember that, I don't know if you remember that when you were a kid, yeah. right? You used to go to like Tom McCann yeah. shoe stores yeah. and Stride Right and yeah. whatever other yeah. kids' shoe stores, Buster Brown. Yeah. <laughs> and they used to have a Braddock device. I still have one in my office. Is that the silver? Yes. Yeah. That slides in. It can measure slider. width and length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you're like a triple E, a double E yeah. or whatever may be the case. So... A good shoe store will still have a Braddock device. If you don't have one, you can visit your local podiatrist. Um, they should have a Braddock device. I don't want to say order one online because they're kind of expensive for like a one-time use. But that'll tell you the, the length and the width of your child's foot. And you should really go maybe a half to a full size greater because they're going to grow into the shoe. You don't want to be buying a shoe that's that fits today, and then in in a week or a month or two months, you're buying a new pair of shoes. Let's try to let's try to get them to last at least six to eight months. Do the shoe stores have those now? Yeah, they do. They still use yeah, them, yeah, like Foot Locker and stuff. Well, okay. A good shoe store will have a Braddock device. Yeah, you know. But do you do you advise for the kids? Do you advise them to go like half a size bigger than what they're measuring? I would go half a size yeah. bigger, half to a full size bigger. All right, so my advice is good because that's usually they'll come in, they'll say, "Doctor Baker, how come he's complaining once in a while?" Blah blah blah. I'm like, dude, because you bought it yesterday, today he grew. The kids are growing. It's not like me or you. So half a size up. By the way, I haven't thought about this in years. Um, God bless. Um, I mean, my mom passed when we were younger, so I don't want to pick on her. But God bless all the shoe salesmen who dealt with my mother. <laughs> I, you just took me back to when we were like eight and like stride eyed. What, what was it? What were the shoes? Stride right, Buster stride Brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom McCann. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd be like in, uh, where would we go? In Jersey City or something. We'd go to like these like like shoe stores. Not yeah, like those stores. Yeah. Or in the mall. Yeah. Like you'd go to Paramus Park or something. And um, man, when we'd go in, first of all, we'd walk in and we'd be like, all right, we want those shoes. That there, it was like a three-hour process. She, she said she she would never. So they would measure us on the little stool that they would bring yeah, out. The right, stool, the man would sit down. He put the shoe on. He tie it for very you. Very nice. And after all that, and he gives a number. He says, "Okay, he's a size four. My mom would then get one. Si she'd be all right. Cool. Get me a three, a four, and a five. <laughs> I'm like, the guy just gave you the size. <laughs> And, she, and she's like, well, you never know. I'm like, no, 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 you do. That's what he just did. You know. And so now he'd come back with a three, four, five, put them on. I'm like, okay, the four works. Surprise. The four works. Not good enough. Let me see you walk. Like I'm on a catwalk. 
I'm like, what can you tell by my gait? And she'd just be sitting there chewing her gum, checking. Still not enough. She pulled, and this is the mother move. I don't know if they still do it, but back in the 90s, this is this was it. Sit there and smash her thumb right here. Yes. Yep. Especially I, sneakers. They still pull that stunt ball? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm At like, least my mom did. I, I'm like, so the professional gentleman here who just did everything <laughs> to hell with him, right? It's the it's the thumb move. And then, uh, I don't know, I'll come back after all that. I always felt bad for the guy. Your mother was right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Z, Jamie Schwad asked you, when was the last time you went to a shoe store? It's true. It's been, it's decades, not years. <laughs> um, next question. Someone asked, I'm prone to getting athlete's foot and I'm always using an antifungal cream. Is there any way to prevent it naturally or even cure it, cure it naturally? That's a good question. So athlete's foot, as many know, it's a fungal infection. Typically it's in between the toes um, because fungus loves a dark, moist environment. So it could be a problem with perspiration, right? That their feet perspire too much. Sometimes it could be the synthetic socks that we wear that don't allow the uh, the area to breathe. And so that causes excessive, let's say, moisture in the area. Um, the idea is just basically to dry it out. So it's not necessarily an antifungal that you need, which is nice. If you do have a, a raging fungal infection, you can use a topical cream. We don't typically give orals for that. Topical should do it. But a drying agent, sometimes like a... A powder, an antifungal powder might be better, right? Change your socks off and let your feet get it some air. It's all about getting, changing the environment from dark moist to a drier environment. Yeah, and the uh, the other thing I would add is when it's recurrent, when it's recurrent, when, when a member has or a patient has this recurrent, the sock thing. And we, we would call it sweaty sock syndrome. And what we would tell, I get this a lot of my like teenage athletes, like, like, kid like plays ball at Bergen Catholic and he's in the office every month with the same problem. Mom's like, what's going on here? What I tell those kids, cause they're prone to sweat and hence prone to the fungal infections. I tell them, I want you to put in your book bag, three pairs of socks when you go to school. So you're going to go to go to school in one pair of socks at lunchtime. I want you changing them. And then when you go to practice, change them. And then after practice, change them. Because most kids, I know what I did when I was a kid, you wake up, in the same socks, you go through all the day in the same socks, you go to basketball practice in the same socks, you come home in the same socks. Um, so I tell them, change them three times 100%. and then make sure you're not sleeping in your socks. Cause a lot, a lot of kids, a lot of people do that. I don't know that. who can sleep really? in their socks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, a lot of people do that. Not me. Now you're looking at me like I do it. I don't do it, but a lot of people do it. Also try to go with natural fibers like cottons and wools. Cottons in the summer, wools in the winter. The synthetics also have very difficult tendency. You didn't know people sleep in their, people sleep in their socks. I think that they they should be evaluated for that. <laughs> like, <clears throat> anyways, next question um, from Taylor Schwide is asking, what is the best athletic shoe for a four year old girl? Well, not just girl, girl boy. Um, typically, we recommend Asics, right? There's a lot of really good shoe stores. Um, I forgot the name of the one that's in Ridgewood, but they actually not only measure the feet, but they they uh, monitor the gait on camera. And so they'll pick out the shoe that's best for running or whatever their sport is. Um, they have these computer models that uh, figure out, just by the way they're walking on a, on a treadmill in the store, what's the best shoe for them. But in terms of brands, they're all made really well these days. Um, but as a profession, we pretty much recommend ASICs, A S I C S. I did not. I don't know have. That. I don't have stock in the company. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Um, I, was <laughs> I was about to say. I was like, are they sponsoring? Like, no, ASICs are good shoes. Is that yeah? Yeah, yeah, they're good shoes. Okay. Comfy. Um, but I don't. You know, um, just for clarity, the the I ha that's a, one of my best friends who just asked that. I just know, um, and he. I just want Jamie um, and Rachel to know. You should only worry about that if. Taylor got Rachel's jeans because if you got Jamie's jeans, you don't have to worry about her athletic prowess. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. it's true. I love him. He's got a lot of gifts, but his I'll get them the name of, of the store in Ridgewood. But yeah. I forgot the name of the. So it could be called a shoe store in Ridgewood. I'm not sure. Um, this is not a question. This is from one of our members, and I'm assuming one of Doctor Econopoli's uh, patients from Jill Jensen. She said Doctor Econopoli came out during a blizzard to perform emergency surgery on my son Derek. He's an amazing doctor, hands of gold. Excellent. That's Jensen. Jensen. So that was way back when with your with your dad. He was the pediatrician oh, no at times. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say what happened. Well, I can get into what happened. I'm just not going to mention names. Um, so I, my recollection is he stepped on a coffee table that was made of glass. L young boy at the time, and when he stepped on that coffee table, the glass shattered and it lacerated the top of his foot. 
it went penetrated the skin and injured like three or four tendons. We had the medical clearance from your dad and um, we repaired the tendons. And now the boy has got to be at least 20, 25 years old because we're going back into the mid nineties and I hate to say age and he's a good, they're still my friends and still patients. <laughs> they live that's, in Seacaucus. That's awesome. Beautiful. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Um, I think Miriam might've asked this question Z. She said, my husband's feet always smell no, no matter what. <laughs> I missed that. What did he say? <laughs> my wife asked this question. Oh, uh, the question is my husband's feet always smell no matter what. Whether, oh God. Whether he worked out or not. How do we fix this? You know, now I know Miriam didn't ask the question. Because I worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Because the workout part. And you know, it's not me. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, for mal odor, which is the medical condition, uh, it's only about topical creams, right? There's nothing. It's all about sweat glands and how what what kind of um, secretions come out of them. And if they're malodorous, you basically got to cover it up. It's like a, like you use a deodorant or an antiperspirant or something like that. You can use different types of creams and whatever they have over the counter. There's really no medication for it that we prescribe. And and what I find is the more sweaty. Back to this first part. That that's almost a preamble to the fungus. Like I notice that when my families come in and they're complaining about that, um, I'll get that. Like they'll complain. They'll be like, hey, they'll send the kid out of the room because they don't want to embarrass him. They're like, Dr. Baker, one more thing. Jimmy, his feet. This happens like once a week. They're like, Jimmy's feet, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, start changing the socks. If it doesn't work in two weeks, text me. And it and it usually works. It's just they're retaining all that malodor and yeah. the sweat. I have a good question. Just change, change, change. Uh, next question. Someone asked, what are your thoughts on callus removals at nail salons and what is, and how to remove calluses safely? So we never recommend anybody other than a professional using a knife blade, if you will. So typically we use a, in the office, we'll use a blade to shave down calluses. But if you're in a nail salon or at home, we recommend only topical treatments like an emery board or you can buy a pumice stone over the counter your skin should be wet so if you're going to try to shave down that callus do it when you're taking right after a shower so that your foot is wet you don't want to put a dry pumice stone onto the dry skin that is um but never ever take a knife to your own foot that's that's the worst thing you could do because god forbid you cut skin then you, you might be dealing with an infection and if you're diabetic then it can become a big problem yeah, yeah. and just out of our practice um we send those immediate. We send all of them straight to you, because I find those treatments generally are not very effective. People are impatient, and then because they're impatient, they end up taking like some cousin's advice and getting a scalpel one day. I see it all the time. And to preempt that, we just send them. And the other thing is the problem with the foot. And this is actually a question I'll have for. This will turn into a question for you. The foot is always the most frustrating part of the body to treat as a primary because it's the one you, you, we how many times we say this you mo you'll know what i'm talking about in a second kid let's say somebody's got a wart here they got a wart on their hand you can try like amiquamide you could try different things and you could get some results the problem with the foot is if there's a plantar wart if there's a callus if there's an injury it's the only part of the body that you have constant insult and preventing healing you can't, you, you can't tell someone to stay off their feet. And so, you know, they sprain something, they hurt something. We, it's the one, it's the one part of the body where quicker rather than slower to refer to specialty. Because in my experience, foot stuff doesn't get better. It doesn't. It needs professional intervention. Even something like a callus, just handle it. Otherwise, you're constantly insulting it every time you step on it. And then you're going to get impatient and do something inappropriately aggressive, like take a blade. And the question that I have for you, um, we look, we're big sports guys. Um, you always hear, um, you know, Bill Walton is the classic example. Um, are you a basketball guy? I do like basketball. All right. So Bill Walton, right? Like talented career ended short. When athletes get foot injuries, it's like devastating. And who was the guy, Portland, uh, he was from Ohio State, seven footer. Greg Oden. Greg Oden, right? He was more knees, but then the feet. Y yeah. Right. So foot, foot injuries really, because, because of that, like you have all your weight on it, right? It's, it's, so can you, can you just make a comment like, what you see when people hurt their feet and don't take it seriously or don't address it, long-term effects, and just general advice like, hey, you banged your foot, and two, three weeks later, it's not bad. Because we all do that, and you give it a week, that's fine, we get it. But it's two, three weeks, and it's a nagging foot injury. Can you just talk just generally about how to, be how to best address it? Well, in general, 
pain should be a stop sign, right? So if you're, if you're experiencing pain in your foot, it should be an indication that maybe I got to see a, a medical professional, start with Dr. Baker's group, and then he'll refer it to the appropriate specialty. And if it's a foot or ankle, thankfully he sends to me. Um, so the bottom line here is pain should be a stop sign. And then you want to find out the underlying cause. So we talked about calluses just a couple of minutes ago. If you have a callus, calluses are usually formed by pressure in certain areas. So find out where the pressure is coming from. If it's something that we can alleviate with maybe a device like an orthotic, so that's a, a device that you put into your shoe, like an arch support, if you will. If that can take pressure off a certain area and decrease the the speed with which a callus comes back, that's something that's beneficial to a patient. Sometimes you can take the pressure off by, let's say, elevating a bone a little bit, what's called an osteotomy to elevate that bone. And like Dr. Baker says, it's got to be a quick treatment and relatively quick recovery because you have to be on your feet every day. So how are we going to manage that, right? So it's it's basically a balance. So if they refer me a patient that has a painful wart, and like he said, you're putting pressure on your foot every day. And if the wart's causing you pain on the bottom of the foot, well, we got to try to alleviate the pressure in that area and treat it at the same time. And that's it becomes a little bit of a balancing act, and that's what I do for a living. And thankfully, knock on wood, we've had good results over the last 30 years or so. Feet are tricky, man, because it's the one place. It's hard. It's a balancing act. But I got to say, you guys, your profession, you are you tend towards the dramatic. I'll tell you why. <laughs> I When I started off, if someone had a foot thing, they come back and there's some bandages. That was like 15 years ago. Then 10 years ago, you guys are like, we're not getting enough shine. We, we need a little more credit. So now foot injury, crutches, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, all right. He's all right. Okay. Now, anybody who has a real foot injury... I see the team opening both doors and the guy's coming in on one of these bikes <laughs> and the boot, right? It's like a boot this big. The guy could have a plantar wart this big. He's in a boot. He's on a bike. And you a, see these bikes? The, the knee scooter. Yeah, the knee scooter. Yeah. You see this? Yeah. I'm like, dude, did you have like leg transplant? <laughs> He's like, no, doc, remember the plantar you said before? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, come on, he's, come on. He's not joking about this. I had one guy come in with a motorized one. I'm like, how are you going to do he this? He probably kept it after it was all good. That's how he's going to work now. He gets a seat on the bus, no questions yeah. asked. Next question. Um, someone asked, when I go for a long walk, my lower back starts to hurt. Could it be from the sneakers I'm using? I know it's a silly question, but... Well, it's tough to diagnose something like that over the over a, a podcast, but you know, typically, if you have lower back pain, you may have a limb length discrepancy too. But you, you have to diagnose it. Is it where's the pain coming from? Right? It it not necessarily is coming from the walking. It could be, right? So we like to think that our profession is going to help out the entire body by elevating if one one side if one side shorter than the other. Um, I would never tell somebody to stop walking because to me, walking is the best medicine if you will right exercise and sunlight Absolutely. being the best medications um or the best doctors but lower back pain and and foot the only thing i would think of right away would be limb length discrepancy how about how about somebody doesn't know that they have flat feet okay great question it's not a question i wouldn't say they don't know they have flat feet but maybe um they want to be examined to see if they have flat feet right um so what, what is a flat foot if you consider an arch, the arch of a foot, and we consider what would be, let's say, quote unquote, normal, it's basically an angular measurement that you would do on an x-ray. And today we don't even have x-rays. Everything's on the uh, on the screen, right? right? It's all digital now. Yeah. So years ago, we used to have a view box, put the x-ray up on yep. the view box, you could measure different angles. But now these these um, x-rays that we have digitally can measure angles, but it's a little, just a little more intricate, if you will. So we measure, let's say, what's called a calcaneal inclination angle and a tailored declination angle. And basically, it, it gives us what we call the quote-unquote normal. Anything lower than that is, let's say, a, a stage or a degree of flat foot. Anything higher than that would be a stage or degree of cavus foot or high arch foot, right? right. The flat foot is basically comes down to the posterior tibial tendon, right. right? The posterior tibial tendon comes down the instep on the inside part of your foot is actually pulling that navicular, that tail navicular joint up. And if that has weakness to it, for whatever reason, the foot will flatten out. And we grade that one to four, right? One being very mild, four being more severe. And if it's one, early signs, you can manage that with, let's say, an orthotic or maybe strengthening, physical therapy. Okay. Four means it's completely flattened out. And there's 
subtalar joint or the joint that's right below the ankle involvement. Something like that might require, let's say, a procedure. So graded one or zero to four. What are, what are the symptoms? Let's say you have a 10-year-old, 20-year-old, 30-year-old who has flat feet that's never been evaluated or addressed properly. Sure. Is back pain? What are, what are the symptoms that... Tire, why do you have to address it? Tiredness will be number one, right? So you want to make sure these kids are active. And that that is a great question. And that that's probably a better one than, um, let's say, talking about a, a cavus foot, for instance. Because cavus foot, we'll get into that later. Flat foot in children. The first thing you're going to see is they're going to become lethargic. They're, going, they're not going to be as active as they like to be. They're not going to play with their friends as much. They're going to say, oh, you know what, my feet, they might say their feet hurt. They might not say their feet hurt right? But you'll see a change in their lifestyle. Whereas last year he was playing more soccer, this year he wants to be in front of a computer 24-7, doesn't want to go outside, doesn't want to play with his friends. Dean and Jed have flat feet. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but yeah, look for a change in lifestyle. Look for tiredness. Look for, um, let's say they may wear their shoes out differently, right? The wear, the wear and tear that they have on their shoes also is an indication of how their foot is adapting to the ground when, they have, when they're walking, the gait analysis, if you will. Those are the signs that I look for. And then what we'll do is we'll do a gait analysis in the office. We'll take an x-ray. And if necessary, like I said, physical therapy and orthotic is definitely the first line, especially in peds, because peds are typically flexible, right? Next question someone asked, when, I, when walking, I feel pain in my calf. Where may that come from? Well, that's typically what we just talked about with Dr. Z, right? That's that's going to be posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, more or less. So, Because he was asking what causes the tiredness or the fatigue before. Um, so typically, if they're going to be a flat, someone that has fatigue, like what you're asking this question on, they're going to be someone that's very flat-footed, and they're using a lot of energy when they're walking because their foot is flattening out, and that energy results in tiredness. Gotcha. Um, and then <clears throat> last question to wrap up the medical part. Uh, someone asked, my son's an athlete and sprains his ankle like monthly. What's the best way to prevent this? Okay, so when you have ligament instability, that's what we just talked about before, yeah. that means you want to brace this with an external support, right? You want to have external support for an internal injury. And to me, the best, and I'm not trying to push ASICs or some other company, but on something like this, my go-to brace is McDavid, right? It's a brand name. Yep. Uh, MC, capital D-A-V-I-D. You can pick them up on any um, Dick's, Dick's Sporting Goods or Amazon or whatever it is. They have braces for knees, shoulders, ankles, elbows, you name it. They're, they're a great company. I'm not invested, them in, invested with them either. Um, and they have different levels of braces depending on if it's a one, two, or three ligament injury, right? So the lateral side of the ankle, meaning the outside part of the ankle, is supported by three main ligaments. And that's how we grade them, grade one, grade two, grade three sprain, depending on if it's a one ligament injury, two ligament injury, three. Doctors are basically dumb, <laughs> that we have no ingenuity. And when it comes to injuries, we grade them one, two, and three, everything, or, or levels one through four, keep however it, simple, it is. Yeah. Keep it simple, exactly. So if it's a one, two, or three ligament injury, they have a brace for each one of those, right? And it's nice because they're, you can see level one brace, level two brace, level three braces. That's basically what it is. And they're laced on the front, and they have two wing straps that crisscross, come up the sides. And what they're going to do is they're going to support the ankle side to side so that the tendons can function up and down, and they're going to limit the amount of inversion and eversion, right? If it's, it's, if it's a grade one, lately I've been going more towards like an elastic support with no laces because I want them to get it stronger on their own. But if this kid is still constantly spraining his ankle, you'd want to get at least a level two brace laced with two wing straps, and maybe you want to get an MRI if he really wants to play sports because you don't want to let that go for too long because the more that ankle is unstable, he'll end up with cartilage lesions and cartilage damage, gotcha. right? You want to st stabilize it. Gotcha. Um, one more question, medical question. Someone asked, what's the best type of shoe for plantar fasciitis? Great question, right? So plantar fasciitis, heel pain, that, that when you wake up in the morning and that fascia, which is a ligament, by the way, starts at the heel, ends up at the ball of the foot. And so remember what we talked about flat foot, where the, we say the, flat, the foot flattens out as you put pressure on your foot. So that ligament on the bottom has to have some elasticity to it, right? Ligaments are elastic fibers. And so give you an example. You, you twist your ankle a little bit like this. That ligament stretches and recoils back to its original position. But there comes a point, let's say, where you twist your ankle so far, you put so much tension on it, the ligament starts to fail. That's a sprained ankle. Or it can rupture. It can rupture mid-substance or pull an avulsion 
like we talked about mm -hmm. before with the tendon. Because yep. tendons and ligaments, same fibers. Okay, let's look at the reverse now. On the plantar fascia, the ligament that's under the foot, that also has elastic fibers that are designed to stretch. So when you put the foot down and the arch collapses a little bit, there's some elasticity to it. Imagine, if you will, it's tight now, so it doesn't stretch. There are adhesions there that cause tightness. So you put the foot down, it wants to stretch, but it doesn't, and it pulls, you get a pain right there on the heel. But then as you walk a little bit, you get up in the morning, you put your foot down, it hurts like a needle sticking you underneath the heel. But then as you walk a little bit, by the time you get to the bathroom or the kitchen, uh, you know what, it's not so bad because the adhesion's broken, it starts to function like it's supposed to. And then what happens is you sit down 20 minutes, you get up, same pain, a post-static dyskinesia, if yep. you will, right? Something like that, how do we treat it? We want to stretch the fascia ultimately, right? And so we recommend first rolling pin exercises. Literally, you can get like a roller, like you would knead bread with or a ball or Amazon sells foot rollers that are like these wooden things that are a little graduated. It's like a massage for your foot. You put your foot on top and you push it out. You roll it out because you just like, like you knead bread. You want to just stretch that fascia out. Sometimes, and the way the algorithm works is stretching, physical therapy, and orthotic to support the fascia. If that doesn't work, anti-inflammatory medication, because I don't lead with that. And then if that doesn't work, I try one, maybe two cortisone injections. But if it hasn't relieved, then we do an endoscopic release where we put a little camera inside. It's a small little portal incision. It's the opening's about the opening of a pen. You slide it in, there's a camera in the operating room because it's like an arthroscopy. You can actually visualize the fascia and then you release it with a knife, one stitch, and they walk the same day. Why do you want them to walk? Because the fascia is released. The more they put pressure on it, the more it'll stretch. The gap that's created will heal. And and that's that's the beauty of that procedure, that there's really no downtime. You do the procedure, they walk the same day, you take the stitches out in a week, it's been nice knowing you. Awesome. Um, I'm assuming this person's new. You could tell he runs a residency program. Yeah. Boy. He explains it, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's one thing to be really smart. It's another thing to be smart and transfer that intelligence. Exactly. That's what a teacher does. That's amazing. Is it okay? Jesus. Okay. It's excellent. Oh. <laughs> a plus. Um, I'm assuming this person's new either to the practice or to the lives. They asked Z, what is your favorite baseball team? I don't like baseball. Yeah. that's. You don't like the Mets? No, I grew up like in baseball, but now... Like honestly, do you sit and watch baseball? No, yeah. it's too boring. I feel like yeah, like I feel I like watch the playoffs. We yeah, no, me too. Yeah, sure. If the Yankee, but like you know, like I feel like we all. I feel like everybody used to like baseball, and now we pretend we do. That's how I feel about I baseball. Agree. Yeah, it's a little slow. Do you like soccer? <laughs> no, that's another one I got to pretend. That one's more real because at least everybody who pretends like everybody who talks to me about baseball when I press them doesn't watch baseball. But I come from a family of immigrants, so, Same here. so they love soccer. Like now, you know, the, the World Cup is coming here. It's going to be here this summer, right? And the championship is going to be at my life stadium. And so, you know, we know guys and tickets and blah, blah, blah. And so I, now everybody's coming out of the woodwork and they're like, hey, Z, blah, blah. And, and you know, my, they're really into it. They tell you about this guy and that guy. And I'm sorry, like, I, I just can't. Like, I can't sit there and watch for 90 minutes. These guys run around. Um, With a I, score of three to two. It just, you know, hockey. Like, I got a couple of friends that like hockey. They're like, no, dude, you got to go to the game and watch it live. I'm like, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. You know how I know I don't have to go watch it live? You know that story. They tell you go watch it live. It's different. You know how I know? Anything I'd rather watch in my living room. There's nothing that's better live. Like, I, like. I, I've gone to a bunch of comedy shows live. You know what I end up doing? Watching the big screen. Or I go to I go to sports games where you're watching. The, why do you think at these stadiums they have big TVs? Because you can't see the field. I'm like, why why did I just spend 200 bucks to come to a stadium? Couldn't find parking. Sit in freezing rain. And I'm I'm leaving the end. I'm leaving early so I don't get stuck in traffic. Yeah. And I'm paying 80 bucks for a hot dog that sucks. When I could have been home and watched it here, and I'm I'm in the stadium looking at the screen, I'm like I'm like, I'm like this is such a racket. So don't tell me I got to go to a hockey game live to appreciate it when even the sports I like I like more not live. So um, yeah, soccer. It's one of those where all my uncles and cousins watching this think it's sacrilegious. I'm sorry, dude. It's basketball and football, and the rest is for the birds. Okay. Yep. Um. That's all I have. What were your thoughts Wait, on but, the, the end of the... But we, we have a Jets fan podiatrist. There's an obvious question that... Oh, no. <laughs> What's the question? The foot fetish. Rex Ryan. 
Is foot fetish a real thing? Is foot fetish a real thing? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the right answer is. Because he's a Jets fan. Do you remember Rex Ryan with the foot fetish? No. No? Yeah. He got Didn't it. he have a tattoo or something yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah, put yeah, on? yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds like Rex Ryan. Yeah. All right. That's all I got for tonight. Okay. So thank you very much. That it was, was awesome. Masterclass. Thank you. Much thank appreciated. You. Great I mean, to see you, man. He it was made, nice seeing you too. Thank he you. made feet fun tonight. He made feet fun. Yeah. <laughs>